Good morning and welcome to our service of worship here at Parma Greece United Church of Christ. Uh, so glad to see all of you this week. Uh, I was out last week, probably you all know that. Uh, a lot of people coming up to me asking me how I'm doing. Lower back spasms are not a lot of fun. Uh, but luckily, I, well, let's see. No, no spasms right this moment, so I'll keep you posted. St. Patrick's Day today. You guys have plans for, for celebrating? Does anybody have any weird St. Patrick's Day traditions? No. Does anybody do uh, corned beef, or is that? It's been done. It's been, it's been done. Yeah. Uh, how about how about whiskey? Anybody? Jameson. Oh yeah. <clears throat> so was that was that you? Mike raised your hand. I have a shot for you later. Okay. All right, sir. All right, so with all that in mind, we're here, and we're ready to worship the Lord together. Uh, I invite you, as we get into worship now, to take this moment to center yourself, to be fully present, and to be ready to receive what the Lord has for us this morning. Join me now in our call to worship. Let us draw near to worship. We draw near to worship God. Let us seek with all our hearts. If we seek, we shall find. Surely goodness and mercy will find us here. Let us rest in the safety of God's love. Focus your minds, steady your hearts, and let us worship together. With one voice we say, Amen. Our opening hymn now is number 442, I'm Pressing on the Upward Way.
us in opposite directions. Are we torn between them? Are we making choices that nourish our souls or our bodies? For what do we truly hunger? Righteousness or material security? so that we might worship you with all we are, living into your kingdom of love. Amen. This morning's Hebrew lesson comes from Jeremiah, chapter 39, verses 12 and 13. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then, when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me, if you seek me with all your heart. For the word of God in Scripture. Thanks be to God. <laughs> And our epistle is from James, chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking of nothing. If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given you. But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter, being doubt-minded and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. For the word of God among us. Thanks be to God. God. Our reading now from the Gospel, our reading from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 6 and verses 25 through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worry, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will God not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, don't worry saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God 
and its righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Today's trouble is enough for today. For the word of God within us. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, throughout the uh, season of Lent here, I've been taking you through the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we've been talking a lot about this difference that the, the sermon makes between the way of the world and the way of Christ. That's, that seems to be at the center, this, this contrast of, of every sermon or of, that, that I've had to do and of course of the Sermon on the Mount as a whole. Uh, and we, uh, let's see, it was two weeks ago now, came to the very center of the Sermon on the Mount, which was to say, can't serve two masters. Okay, <clears throat> so what we can do then is we can begin to understand that that's sort of the lens that we need to see everything else that's being said in the Sermon on the Mount through. So when we're keeping in mind the idea that we don't want to serve two masters, that we want to love the Lord and love the kingdom of God and love the righteousness of God and reject and despise the others, which is what the scripture says to do, then that brings into focus for us a different way of being. Right? That's, that's the way of Christ that we've been talking about. Uh, in this message, I want to bring it intensely personal, right? We can talk about, you know, the, the way of Christ versus the way of the world in terms of, of a lot of, you know, macrocosmic kind of things, big things, you know, life decisions. But I want to bring it much smaller than that today. I want to bring it so close to home that it's maybe going to be very uncomfortable. And yet... If we're really going to do what the sermon says and develop within ourselves the capacity to serve only one master and no longer be divided, then it's sort of, it's this sort of discomfort that's necessary. So with that, everything that registers as a happening in our minds, so, so everything that comes in, whether it's a thought or a feeling, a reaction, a, a, a habitual action, or, or a conscious choice, everything, comes with a story that's attached to it. Uh, we tell ourselves stories, subconsciously, uh, stories about what a thing means, about what significance it bears, uh, about what information is revealed by it. We're always parsing. It's kind of how we function, right? So for today's message, what I want to do is, is talk about this one thing as it relates to this whole idea of being single-minded in your devotion to Christ, and that is stop the story stream. Now, we haven't talked at length uh, much about the struggle between the ego and the authentic self. Uh, that's something that, that I talk about a lot to myself um, in my own personal development, but it's not something I've brought a ton into the pulpit because it's, it's difficult to, to define and to understand. Um, ego is one of those terms that gets thrown around a lot, so I think if we're going to talk about this, that I really need to define it, so, so I will. So when I refer to ego, what I'm referring to is that construction of self that emerges as a result of condition. It's the quote-unquote you that pops out the other end after the world has had its go. It's perhaps a stream of consciousness that is made up mostly of stories that were learned at some point Sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way. Uh, but these stories, these conditions, they, they play on repeat. And these are stories that, that form in you due to the influence of, of parents, peers, strangers, core memories, including traumatic ones. You know, it's both the good lessons and the lessons that we might prefer to forget. Now, what, what occurs is, that during your formative years, 
your subconscious takes all that in and it processes it over the course of a decade or more and it constructs a psyche. A psyche that can function if necessary, and it often is, with latent pain and perceived uh, insecurity. Or a psyche that is designed to lean heavily on whatever it is that has made you feel safe and fulfilled during that period of time, your condition. So the, the you, if you will, the you that materializes in that manner is not truly who you are. It is rather your subconscious defense and coping mechanisms. And it is, it is those things crystallized into patterns of thought and behavior and feeling. But it feels like you, but it isn't. It, what it does is it masquerades as you. It's a false self, it's a construction. And it'll go on masquerading as you for the remainder of your life, unless you intervene. Now, from where I'm sitting, becoming aware of that, awakening, if you will, to the influence of the ego, is equivalent to spiritual awakening. Because once you begin to perceive the difference between the light that you are just reflecting, that bounces off you and back out into the world, versus that light that emanates from your own soul, and you see that they're actually different colors, there's no going back. Now, in my own awakening, in struggle with ego, if you will, uh, I've learned something key that I want to share with you today. That's this. The authentic self, that is, the you that you choose to be, the you that emerges as it is freed from unconscious conditions and patterns, the authentic you does not tell itself stories. These, these conditions, these, these recordings that, that play on, on repeat, the patterns of behavior and thought and feeling that, that play out as a result, the authentic self produces none of those. That's all the ego is doing. The authentic self accepts what is without the need to create a narrative about it. And it's able to do that simply because it knows it is secure. It's not motivated by fear. I'll give you an example. So say, you know what, let's, let's go here. We're gonna go here today. Say you're driving. I don't know if there's any place in my life that my ego is stronger than when I'm behind the wheel of the car. Anybody? Uh, Maybe identify with that just by a show of hands. I'm up here doing it like in front of you in person, so you can raise your hand. Okay, just me and Susan apparently and Joanne. Everybody else is, is not like no no word range at all. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'm just gonna go on then. So say you're driving and uh, and somebody cuts you off in traffic. We've all been there. Annoying. Dangerous? Also, yeah. But personal? No. So here's me going out on the limb and admitting a flaw. Now I have to be honest and tell you that in the past when I have been cut off in traffic, a story ran in my mind, a story I told myself in many situations like that one over many years. And I experienced that story as a reaction, an emotion, less so verbally, it took some it took a long time for me to finally see it and be able to put it into words. But when I was able to put it into words, here's what it sounds like. The other driver is laughing at you. He cut you off and now he's feeling that he's won a victory over a loser. Ooh, I was talking to myself like that. No wonder I got so angry. 
my ego perceived being cut off in traffic as a personal slight. Now, this story that I was telling myself has no basis in reality. It's not true. Feelings are not facts. It has no connection to the present moment. It was conditioned in me long ago. And there it was playing out again and again and again and again. And it would have kept playing out for the rest of my life had I not stepped in the middle and hit that stop button on that tape that would play. Every time that I felt like something could be personal, I made it out to be personal. I wondered for years why I had such a difficult time controlling my anger character when I was driving. And I experienced such conflict over it. I couldn't understand. Like I'm making all this progress spiritually and yet I like, put me behind the wheel and I'm just yelling at people. Like, what is it? It wasn't until I began to search through the anger and observe it as a third party Yes, I was feeling it, but I began to understand that it wasn't really me. I began to see it as somehow foreign to me. And then I saw the truth, that it wasn't me at all. So now, when I feel that sort of anger bubble up, it feels less powerful. I, mean, I can't tell you it's gone yet. But I know that it doesn't come from my authentic self. I know that it's the product of some bad conditioning. I was probably between the ages of about six and eight years old when it, when it first formed. It's not my fault. You know? I did not know what I was doing. But now I do. And now that I know, how can I go back and keep doing The awareness changes it. That's, that's actually how growth and transformation happens. I am more free through this exercise to be my true and best self as this unconscious thought feeling reaction is converted into conscious thought. So what is the conscious thought that I choose? It's to Remember, that even when I'm behind the wheel of a car and somebody does something rude, that it wasn't about me being lesser. It's about whatever's going on in that person's day. It had nothing to do with me. That there's still somebody who, if I met them on the street, I'd shake their hand, look them in the eye, and tell them God loves them. I can't lose sight of that just because I feel personally attacked. So I'm, I'm dealing with it. And very soon, now that I've made that separation between both what I understand is me, what I choose to be, whatever that is, now that I've separated them, the old one is very soon going to disappear. Not the first time I've done this. Now, you may be thinking that what I am describing here today amounts to more or less therapy. Anybody ever here ever been to uh, cognitive behavioral therapy? This is pretty much what I'm talking about. You know, this idea of mindfulness, converting unconscious thought into conscious thought. I mean, it's not exactly a mystical spiritual experience, right? So if, if you had connected those dots, I'm going to tell you you're right. Uh, but what I will add to it is to say that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. I want you to understand that spirit is not magic. It's, it's not necessarily mystical. I mean, there's mystery, certainly. But, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about is this idea that it's part of the universe. And I think that's very clear in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, consider the lilies. Consider, look at the birds. It's part of the universe. It's part of you. It's part of me. It's part of all nature. And if that's the case, if that's really true, then we shouldn't have to go very far to discover it. It should be in the fabric of everything. It 
should be in the fabric of cognitive behavioral therapy, and of course we find that it is. Should be, if that were true, spirit would be as near to us as, as sunlight, as breath, as water. Now, in my case, this is, so let's, let's, let's take it a step further here. What I've talked about so far, we could say it's personal growth and evolution. Spiritual growth on my part occurred when I realized that I had gained power over this so very visceral reaction that had really governed me for many years. Something I had to manage. And I put two together and I came to see that I didn't need any longer to be carried along by it. And that in general, through this discipline, this mindfulness, that I've gained a greater control <laughs> over myself, a control that not even a strong trauma response can overcome, that's your control. And that's given me a clearer awareness of, of who and what I really am, who I choose to be. And it's empowered me to live into that truth. And that, everybody, is what spiritual growth is. So people of God, my message to you today is very, very clear and simple. You know, you want to grow spiritually? Stop the story stream. Stop that stream of stories that divides you, that clutters your mind, that creates chaos. Stop them by coming to understand that both those stories and the version of you that they create and sustain, they're not really you. They don't have power over you. They never did. Who you are cannot be dictated to you by the world or by anyone or anything in it. You get to decide that. And when you start peeling back the layers of artificiality, these constructs, these conditions, these reactions. It's a glimpse finally, the real you that comes from the place where you get to choose and, and see finally your own pure heart. What you find is Christ. You find, as you go deep like that, that you really are indeed a child of God. That you are loved totally. That you are cherished unconditionally. That you are provided for and esteemed in the household of God. And as you discover that bit by bit, step by step, you learn how to say goodbye to all those old worries. That's what I was doing. I was out there worrying on the road. It took the form of anger. I said goodbye to it. You say goodbye to that and then all the background noise. And then you can finally be at peace. Having been empowered thereby to seek first and as we read from the prophet Jeremiah, seek only the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. And thanks be to God. Our homily hymn now is number 444. We are often tossed and driven.
Well, we come now to the blessing of our gifts. Uh, we take a moment on uh, every Sunday morning when we gather together to bless all the gifts uh, that you all are bringing in. Uh, we think, of course, of your financial donations uh, that go in the offering plate there. You know where it is. We don't need to put it under your nose. We think of you know, all the other donations of, of time, talent, and expertise, you know, smaller sorts of items uh, that, that you're making throughout the week and the month and the year. All of those get included in the blessing of the gifts. So let's take a moment now and bless all of those gifts together. We seek your kingdom and your righteousness, O God. Let these gifts demonstrate our single-minded devotion and trust in you. Receive our gifts, O God, and bless them, we pray. May they speed the coming of your kingdom in our community. Amen. Prayers of the people, the Lord be with you. And also with you. And Let us pray. Prayer. Yes. May I add a couple, please? You may. Um, to, we're thankful that you're back. That's a joy that you're back with us and feeling better. And Sam is here this morning, and that reminded me of something that she told me last week about Dave Harrison's son. And I wonder if you would share that with the congregation, Sam. Well, um, Jacob, um, sorry, um, had reached out to me through Facebook Messenger saying that he was in a rehab in Pennsylvania and he has a lung clean and he's doing well. And I said, well, you know, there's still people that do love you. And he said, well, thank you for saying that. And, you know, I said, I'm always here. You can always reach out. So, that's pretty much it. Wow, that's amazing news. I mean, just by a show of hands, how, how many here have been around addiction one way or another? Thank you. Almost everybody. You know then how difficult it is for somebody to get clean, stay clean. A month of clean, that's, that's incredible. No matter what the substance was, I, I mean, it's very difficult to do. Um, so we, we share that joy. And while we're at it here, um, let's, let's add prayers. They're, they're sorely needed for, for Jacob. That, uh, that by grace that he would find within himself the ability to stay the course. In your mercy, O Lord, yeah. hear our prayer. Uh, but I do want to acknowledge the, the, the joy before we go on. I'm back! I love being back. This is great. Uh, and Sam, so glad that you're here. Uh, joy for Logan's birthday. Who put that one? I put that on. Yes. Logan is our latest uh, grandson-in-law. <laughs> we have not yet met, but today is his birthday. Was he born? Well, no. He's married to our youngest granddaughter. Okay, so not exactly. Son-in-law. That's funny. Son okay, so we do share your joy for, for Logan's birthday. Yeah, hopefully we'll meet him one day. <laughs> Ideally. Once you, you had met him, I figured he had to be really young. <laughs> All right. And then uh, we've already mentioned St. Patrick's Day. There's a parade. Enjoy the parade. What's that? Parade was, was yesterday. Makes sense. All right. We're going to get past the joys. I'm butchering these. Okay. Uh, we get into then uh, concerns. And uh, uh, just begin first with uh, some folks who are under a lot of stress. Gary, Nicole, Matthew, Natalie, Dennis, and uh, the Oster family. Um, now, is this a joy that there's a new job and also a concern? Yeah. Yeah. It's a joy and a concern. I, I understand how that goes. Like, it's great and it's stressful. Yeah, so, so we'll definitely move that up as well. Uh, so let us pray. 
Chris Scott, uh, we lift up to you these folks who we've mentioned. And while we're at it, we, we add to that list folks that we're thinking of right now who are also under a lot of stress and can use a dose of that inner peace that we're talking about today. We, we pray that by grace that you would supply them with that peace that passes understanding and that you would be with them in a very special way that reminds them, that makes them more aware that they are greater than they think that they are. That they can do more than they perhaps believe that they can do. Empower them, we pray, to take the control that they want to take of the, themselves and their lives. By grace we pray. In your mercy, Lord. Uh, prayers for some folks who are dealing with illnesses. Uh, Pete, who is dealing with a cancer diagnosis. Uh, Ramona, who is in dialysis. Let's see, Sheila, which I think we all know what that one is. Uh, the Vanderborg family, uh, let's see, who has a daughter who awaits a heart transplant. Oh my goodness. 32 years old. 32 years old and waiting, waiting a heart. Let's go ahead and pray. Gracious God, we lift up to you uh, these folks who we've mentioned. And sometimes I try to think of a cute prayer to pray, but this one's really simple. But we just ask that you bring these people to health. Don't often understand why. Certainly, in these cases, that's not any different. But for Pete, we just we ask that that cancer will be brought to remission, and for Ramona, we ask that there will be a solution found so that she doesn't have to be in dialysis for her life. And for Sheila, that she would recover just as fast as she can. That you would grant her peace in her in her mind, in her heart, in her body. And for the Vanderbilt family. Of, uh, let's, see, let's just say Joe H. Um, Hamill. Hamill, who, who passed away. Let us pray. Gracious God, we, we lift up to you everyone who's grieving that loss today and others. Uh, and, and we ask that in their grief, everybody has grieved differently, but that in their grief, to seek you. Let them not be overcome or swallowed by it, but by grace, grant them the ability to reach out and to find the light again. Grant them comfort, we pray, in your mercy, O Lord. Your Lord. Uh, and then there's, there's a few like larger prayers. It says to pray for <laughs> Palestine, American politics, and our world. And boy, if we wanted to really pray for those, that's all we would do. So I'm going to say, uh, uh, just a quick one. Excuse me. <coughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, when, when we come to you with large prayers, we often feel very small. And, and rightly so. These, these things are much bigger than we have any ability to influence. But not you. You are, you are greater than they. Your arm is not too short, short nor, nor your voice too weak. You are able to bring peace. You are able to bring stability. And we simply pray that as you are doing that, that you would continue to do it even more. Your kingdom is coming will is in the process of being done. It is being worked out with fear and trembling. All we can do is commit ourselves to walk your way and to say, with our hearts
parts of our lives, your kingdom come, your will be done. May it be so according to your will, we pray. In your mercy, O Lord. Amen. 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 And now we pray together with the words of our Savior twice. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn now is number 438. Uh, this, is a, this is one of those ones that we all know you should be able to sing it. It is well with my soul. Is not life more than food and clothes? Much more, for we are souls before we are bodies. Know today, beautiful souls, that you are loved and valued by God. Much more than many sparrows and lilies. Now our service is ended. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.
left a little package on the table in the office addressed to me for Sammy and Jamie. It was a um, couple of little books on the eclipse and farm animals and how the farm animals couldn't understand what was happening and it had to be explained. They thought that something was eating the sun. So they were really sweet and cute and I thank you whoever brought those. We read them yesterday when everybody was around. Um, flowers. Who brought the flowers and who are they for? Pamela. I brought them. It's um, my daughter's birthday on Tuesday. Happy birthday. Well, thank you. <laughs> I will pass that along. They're very lovely. Yes. Thank you again. Um, activities, oh, special offerings, one great hour of sharing. Uh, if you have not handed that in, there's still time to do that. Um, and our calendar tomorrow is book club at 2 o'clock here in the music room, I think. That's, That's usually where yeah. we yes. So Mike, be sure we have some heat at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Lauren sent out a letter that we all should have gotten this week that was asking for cost-cutting ideas to sort of try to readjust our budget a bit to meet what we might be able to, to spend. Um, so get back to Lauren. I found it very difficult to come up with ideas, Dick and I, um, but I have a couple, so. Um, we'll be talking about that more as we have uh, a council meeting, etc. Um, Tuesday, our uh, Pastor Brad has office hours, and he will be here from 10 to noon, I think. And Wednesday is, is this the last Lenten lunch? Yes. Okay. And that's at St. Leo's at 12 o'clock. And food shelf needs, um, they're listed in your bulletin. The Hilton food shelf really needs toilet tissue. Now, uh, <laughs> do we have enough? Do we have enough? Yeah. Oh, I think you said got it. Like, oh, got enough. Huh. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. Sam, yeah. Sam's yeah. got a supply that oh, she's got to okay. bring. Okay. It's, it's a funny thing. You think of the food shelf and you never think of something like toilet tissue. But people need <laughs> toilet tissue and it costs money, so <clears throat> it needs to be included. And the grease food shelf. Needs, some, needs cereal. So if you if we put that in the baskets out there, does it get to the grease food shelf? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. That's all I have. Any other announcements or comments? Now, are we are the choir people choir people meeting with Joanne? Yes. Immediately. Yes. Okay. And everybody else can go back and have something to eat. So have a great week. Thank you.